Uh, turn with me, first of all, to Mark chapter 8, beginning there with verse 14. Mark chapter 8, beginning with verse 14. I want to talk today, and I was, I was noticing, um, I'd read an article um, uh, leading up to the solar eclipse, and they were, they were going through uh, a bunch of numbers of why the Lord was going to come back on Monday and how those numbers lined up and everything. And, and um, I, didn't, I didn't fully comprehend it all, and I wasn't you know, totally focused on what I was reading either, so I, um, I can't remember all that they said, but I thought to myself that um, no magical number, uh, uh, arranging of numbers is ever going to force God into a box that he's going to say, okay, I guess i got to come back today. You know, I'll send my son back today. Um, that never happens. God will never put himself into that kind of a situation. His math is so much different than our math ever is. And we, we figure out something, and it never works out the way that um, the Lord wants to. And so he goes by an entirely different math than we are accustomed to. His ways, the Scripture says, are higher than ours. And so we don't often understand the way that he works. For example, um, in the Scripture, there, in the Gospels, there is the recording of the feeding of the 4,000, and they were there was uh, seven loaves and a few small fish that they took first in order for that miracle to happen. After they were done eating... They picked up seven basketfuls that were left over. In the feeding of the 5,000, they had five loaves of bread and two fish. When they're all done eating, they picked up 12 basketfuls left over. So a little later on, the disciples were in a boat, and they're crossing over the lake, and the Scripture says that they forgot to bring bread. Let's read from verse 14 on here. It says the disciples had forgotten to bring bread, except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. Be careful, Jesus warned. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. They discussed this with one another and said, It is because we have no bread. Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, Why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Or are your hearts hardened? Do they have do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? Twelve, they replied. And when you broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? And they answered, seven. He said to them, do you not still understand? So, he had been, Jesus had been talking to the Pharisees just before they left in the boat. And so when they're all gathered together in the boat, he says to the disciples something that was already on his mind because of what he was teaching with the Pharisees. He says, be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees. And you know how sometimes when you're listening, you only hear what you want to hear? I mean, I don't know if some of you spouses do that. You know, you're... Your wife's talking to you, and you're only hearing what you want to hear, or vice versa. And so oftentimes here we, we pick up on something that triggers something in our mind, and all of a sudden we start paying attention again, and, and the disciples were like that. And so whenever he said yeast, they go, oh, oh, yes, bread. He's, he's kind of trying to get back on us because we forgot to bring any with us. And they, they're talking among themselves, and obviously Jesus hears them talking, and they figured, oh, he's going to give us a, you know, a little lecture about not bringing any bread with us on this trip. And then Jesus says to them, you of little faith, why are you talking among yourselves because you have no bread? Do you not still understand? And then Jesus gives them a little lesson in kingdom math. They, they were not getting this at all. And so he goes through that whole scenario again, 4,000 with seven loaves then 5,000 with five loaves. And something all of a sudden dawns on them, like the light clicks on it. All of a sudden, the disciples understand, and they're going, oh, we're getting this now. So can you imagine that? And, imagine, and the disciples are probably going, 
Ah, oh, that aha moment that comes to them, and they're figuring all of a sudden, you know what? Wow, I wonder if Jesus only started with three loaves, could he maybe feed 7,000 or 8,000? Or what if he only started with two loaves? Maybe he could go feed 10,000 or 11,000 people, plus women and children. Imagine that, and then maybe it just finally dawned then on them, what if Jesus had nothing to start with? I wonder how many he could feed then. And probably it's like, wow, we, we, just, we have just got this now. That the Lord can do absolute miracles whether you, we give him a small amount or whatever the case, or whether he has nothing to work with at all. He can do incredible miracles. And he wanted to teach them that very simple math lesson that less is always more in the kingdom of God. There is a principle all throughout Scripture that God adds by subtracting. Now, I'm sure Mrs. Jacobs would say, no, that doesn't really work in real math. You never, you never add by subtracting. God does that, though, in Scripture. That principle is especially true in our spiritual walk with the Lord. So look over to Proverbs chapter 25. Proverbs 25, verse 4. I remember this verse from the Bible school days and how the teachers would often talk about this verse and why we were there in school and what the Lord wanted to do in our lives. And so it says in verse 4, Remove the dross from the silver, and a silversmith can produce a vessel. Remove wicked officials from the king's presence, and his throne will be established through righteousness. So whenever silver ore is first mined, there are many other metals and rocks that might be part of that. So it has to go through a purifying process. They heat that silver up until it is at 961.8 degrees Celsius, which is about 1,763 degrees Fahrenheit. I mean, very, very hot. And at that temperature, then, the impurities float to the top, they skim off the top of those impurities, and then the, the, the silver becomes very pure. Silver, of all the metals, will bring to it a most lustrous shine when all of the impurities are taken out. So this is what Solomon is writing here and what he had in mind when he's writing about God's purifying process, the purifying of our hearts and our lives. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 25, goes along with this very same idea, and he says, I will turn my hand against you. I will thoroughly purge away your dross and remove all of your impurities. Now, in our culture today, there are some churches that have been conditioned by the world, and, and you might call them feel-good churches or whatever the case might be, seeker-sensitive, but we, the idea is that we want everything that is said in that church to be very positive, and not that that's necessarily wrong, but we don't want to say anything that would be offensive in any way. So we don't, we don't want anybody in the audience to ever to be offended, so we're going to be very careful about how we word everything that's done in the service. I, I saw recently, and I don't know if it's, I didn't bother checking if it was absolutely true or not, but I saw that a very prominent large church recently um, said that they would not wor uh, mention words like the blood and the cross and suffering during Easter because they'd be having many visitors come through at that time and they didn't want anybody to be offended. But the message of the cross has always been very unpopular. From back in Jesus' time, I mean, even in the, in the time of the apostles, it was always an offensive message. It's offensive to many today. Many do not want to hear about the cost of serving Jesus. Instead, they're interested, what do I get out of this? <laughs> what, what comes to me, out of, to me out of serving the Lord Jesus Christ? Tell me about the healings. Tell me about the blessings. Don't tell me about commitments and cost. And so God's blessings are, are absolutely fabulous, and they're great, and we do need them. 
And we are in a country where we know of the blessings of God. We have been blessed in America beyond any other country on the face of the earth. He does heal our bodies. He does provide us with nice homes and reliable vehicles to drive and so many other good things. We can't thank him enough for what he's done for us and what he's provided for us and the blessings that he has brought our way. He is a good, good father in so many ways. We have been blessed beyond measure. But the greatest work that he always wants to do in us is not necessarily in the external things. As blessed as that is, the, the things that he provides us with here in this earth, great things. But the work that he mainly wants to do within each one of us is something more internal than external. If he provides you with a nice car, it'll eventually rust away. If he heals your body, you might end up getting something later on and maybe something that you eventually even die from. Our bodies, the scripture says, are decaying, wasting away every day. And so even when God does bring a healing, it doesn't mean that, that, that you're going to end up living forever and ever and ever. There, there'll be something else that comes. Everything here on this earth will eventually wear out. Everything. All the blessings that we could receive from the Lord here, they're temporal. They're not something that will last throughout eternity. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, Paul writes there, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power, and get this, that is at work within us. So he's doing this work, the greatest work that he wants to do within us, not on the external blessings. That's just the icing on the cake. He wants us to become more like him. And so he does his greatest work inside of us. What he wants to change in us is the greatest work that he wants to do. Paul was writing the young pastor Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, and this is what he said. Preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. There is something in our culture today that, that we're, we want the encouragement. Yeah, bring on the encouragement. But we're not interested in the other two-thirds. We're not interested in the correction. We're not interested in the rebuke. We want just the good stuff. Just give me the love of God. I don't want to hear anything else. Just the love of God. And so in the work that God wants to do in our lives, he has to remove the dross, the impurities, before he can add to what he wants for us. You get more in the kingdom of God by having less. How many sports teams, and I was thinking about this, have to discipline the, some of the players on their team? And even if they're one of the star members of the team, a coach cannot let Bad behavior go on, and it goes. It'll go through the entire team, and there'll be a lack of morale in the in, in the whole um, interest of the team if he doesn't discipline when there is bad behavior, even if it's somebody that's a star in the team. So the coach knows that the team becomes better, even if they have to eliminate one member of the team, one player simply because of the bad behavior there. He knows that he can make a better team by simply bringing discipline to bear. I, we were, years ago, um, Darlin and I and our, our kids attended Brooklyn Tabernacle with Pastor Jim Simula, and uh, the history of that church, it runs about, I think, about 10,000 on a Sunday morning. But when Pastor Simula went to that church, it was running about 20 people in a, a little, wee, little wee church there um, in Brooklyn. And uh, so he, when he went there, he said there were so many things that were so out of order and everything. And he said, and there were people there that would just speak out whatever came to their mind. And he said it was. He said it got almost circus-like at times in the services. And he said I, I would go home and just go, oh Lord, this is the, we're never going anywhere. And he said it just there was a whole attitude there that was in in the church and. Um, they, they were resistant to things, and there were people that wanted to be in charge that weren't ready to be in charge. And he said there were, there were just so many things out of order in that church. 
And so he said, I'm a, I'm, I'm a brand new pastor. I'm young. And he said, I, I really wrestled with what to do. He said, the pastor before me had decided that he was not going to do anything about it because he felt that if he, if he said anything to any of the members of the congregation, he might offend them and they might leave. And a church of 20 couldn't afford to lose anybody. Pastor Simula prayed about it, and he said, no, that's not how you want your church to operate. It says right in the Scripture how you want us to operate. And so he began to correct some things lovingly with different people of the church. He lost some. <laughs> he lost some of the 20. But God began to rebuild in that church and put his strength in that church, and that small group of people began to pray and seek the Lord, and God kept adding to their numbers. Um, by the time that we went there in 1980, they were probably running about 1,800 at that time. And, and Pastor Simla's message never changed. I remember the first Sunday we got there, and he was talking about Jesus feeding the multitudes. And many of those disciples, many of those that were interested in the free lunch, did not continue to follow him. And Pastor Simla said, you know what, I, I have to speak the truth whether this church grows or not. Whether we get bigger than 1,700, 1,800 people or not, I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in making true disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we're going to truly commit to following him no matter what happens in our lives, that we're determined to serve him. He was determined to share the entire message of what the gospel was about, whether it was offensive or not, doesn't matter. And so if silver is contaminated with dross, it does no good just to add more silver ore to the mix. The impurities first have to be removed. If the doctor says to me, and he has, <laughs> he says, you've got to lose some weight, Tim. And if I say back to the doctor, um, you know, don't you have a pill for that? I mean, there's the, I, I don't want to lose the weight, so just give me some kind of pill that will fix this whole thing. And the doctor says, there's nothing to fix it, Tim. Got to lose the weight. I, I can have all the excuses in the world, but I, that will not take care of what needs to be taken care of until I remove something. If there's a cancerous tumor in your body, it has to be removed. So it is with our walk with the Lord. God does not make peace with the things that are in our lives that are not pleasing to him, he's not going to say, okay, I'm just going to let you have that. We'll work some other way around that whole thing. He is constantly at war with the things that should not be there. He wants them removed. He wants to do the surgery that he wants to do on our lives. We can, we can dance and we can have a great time in the service, but when the dust all settles, what God is interested in is that there is a change that happens inside of us. Sometimes he's interested in doing some surgery. Sometimes he's interested in pouring in the oil and the wine for healing. Whatever the case is, he wants a change to take place within inside of each one of our lives. We have the opportunity as we gather together to be confronted by the truth of God's word. And a transformation needs to take place when we're confronted by the Holy Spirit. Nothing else really matters. Those are the important things. And so God, because he loves us so incredibly much, always comes to us and always tells us the truth. He is absolutely ruthless in going after the things that will spoil the flow of his grace and his blessing in our lives. So how does God refine us? And here's the bad part. <laughs> Often the refining work of God um, is uncomfortable. Being in the refiner's fire is not a great experience in that sense. As far as humanly speaking, it's not something that we just absolutely look forward to. The method of getting rid of the things that are not pleasing to him in our lives often involves uncomfortable situations. As a parent, I, I can remember Darla and I talking about this, but whenever our, our, we were first getting our kids, we were talking about, like, how do we discipline and how do we, how do we want them to be and, and what does the Lord expect of us as parents? 
And, and we came to this point that we decided that we have to, out of love, discipline our kids at times because we don't want them to grow up to be monsters. We, we, we don't want them to be the kind of kids that nobody wants to be around because they're so unruly and so lacking in behavior. And so we, out of love, we decided, no, you know what? We're going to have to do some things. We're going to have to do things that we don't even like doing. We didn't like disciplining our kids, but we knew that it was necessary in order for them to become the kids that the Lord wants them to be and that we wanted them to be. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 11 and 12 says, My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent his rebuke because the Lord disciplines those that he loves as a father, the son he delights in. And so God uses very difficult times in our lives to refine us, to take out the impurities that shouldn't be there. He turns up the heat, so to speak, on the difficulties that we go through in life. And, of course, we hate that. We, we don't want any of that. We fight against it, and our flesh doesn't like it. But God knows the importance of what he's doing in our hearts and lives as he removes the dross, the impurities from our hearts and lives that shouldn't be there, that he wants to take away so that he can add so much more grace and blessing to our lives. Look at Acts ch chapter 18 in closing. Nikki Hostetler um, posted a devotion on Facebook, and I, I believe it was just this past week, and I as I read through it, I thought, wow, that is so incredibly true of what God is trying to do in our lives. But look just real quickly at these three verses. Acts chapter 18 says, After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker, as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath, he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. So here, uh, Priscilla and Aquila, they're living in Rome, and um, persecution comes against them. Claudius, the ruler, decides that he doesn't want any Jews living there anymore. Now, this isn't the kind of thing where, you know, you got a notice from the government and it says, you know, you, you have to move and we'll give you six months to pack up and take care of your affairs and then you got to get out of the country. It wasn't that at all. Things were handled in those days. Troops would come to your door and they'd say, get out of your house, get out of here, leave the country. And so Priscilla and Aquila end up with all that they have known, their friends and their, their business there in Rome and all the things that they were doing, all of a sudden it immediately comes to a halt. I mean, you can only imagine the turmoil that you would feel if the government came to you today and says, get out of your house and get out of this country today. Leave. You'd go like, God, like, what is with this? What are you doing? And Priscilla and Aquila then end up, and they end up going to Corinth a long ways. And there in Corinth, they end up coming in contact with Paul. And Paul is a tent maker, and they are tent makers, and so I'm sure they hit it off together. And so they probably are sharing ideas about how to make tents, and that set the whole conversation off. But this couple, this married couple, ends up being a very key element in reaching the known world with Christianity. This couple ends up coming alongside of Paul and ministering with Paul to very key churches, Corinth, Ephesus. And then later on, they were very key. They ended up, after Claudius died, going back to Rome and being very key and starting many churches there. Priscilla and Aquila, they were used of God. They're probably 
um, one of the most influential couples that was used by God along with Paul in order to spread the gospel in the early church time. But it would have never, ever happened if they had not gone through such an unpleasant experience of getting kicked out of their houses. That, that very traumatic experience that they went through, is as unpleasant as it was, was the very key that they went through that and maintained an attitude of, Lord, whatever you're doing, you're working. <laughs> and so whatever you're doing in my life to remove the things that you don't want there, you do that. And God was able to take that couple and use them in a greater way than probably they ever would have imagined on their own. It is even said and suggested by some, and I have, I have no way to prove this, but that some have suggested that Priscilla went and ended up being the writer of Hebrews, maybe along with Paul, but he ended up being one of the writers of Hebrews. God used this couple in a tremendous way, and they went through such a difficult time in their lives, but they let God do the work that he wanted to do through them. In all of our lives, we have difficulties that we go through, and God is trying to teach us something. He's trying to get a hold of something in our lives to remove something so that he can add such greater blessings to what he wants to do in your life. Worship team, if you get ready to come. Years ago, um, I remember I was thinking about it this past week of when we first dropped our firstborn, Nikki, off at Valley Forge for school. And it was a difficult thing, and it was miles away. It was on the other side of the state. And so we, we had a little motor home at the time. We took the motor home down there. We uh, dropped her off, unloaded everything, and then we went to a campground because there was going to be a couple of events that were going to happen on Saturday, and then we would say goodbye. And so that night, we, I went to the campground, and we set up, and we, that night I couldn't sleep at all. I'm tossing and turning, and I'm thinking, wow, boy, those 18 years just flew by in a second. And I began to think about all the things that we had done in raising her, and I, I tossed and turned all night long, and I thought, Lord, I hope we've done a good job. I hope, you know, I hope we have put something in her that wants to serve Jesus now that she's no longer under our house. I hope there's something, there's something built inside of her that we gave her that wants to serve you for the rest of her life. But I, I was really concerned about it. I thought, Lord, man, I, I probably have made a bunch of mistakes and all of those kinds of things in raising her. And the Holy Spirit really just kind of brought home to my heart that whatever was done in the past I, I can't do nothing about that. I can't rewind the tape and go back. I can't do that. But I can be determined from whatever lessons learned, whatever difficulties we went through, and whatever you did in our hearts and our lives to change us, I can from that day forward do something different. Whatever that is, God, we're surrendered to you. Whatever you want for our lives, from this moment on, Make a difference in us. Change us, Lord, from the inside out. Make a difference in our hearts and lives so that we might be able to affect those that are, that are around us, those that are so desperately needing to see Jesus. Lord, don't let us not hinder that. Help us, Lord, to be able for people to see in us the Jesus that you really are, Lord.